which is where he currently lives with his wife and three children, three teenage children. And he's originally uh, born in Korea, still has family uh, ties in Korea, and he travels comfortably uh, in cross-ethnic and is recognized for his work in uh, ethnic diversity domestically and abroad. So it's my pleasure to introduce Pastor Eugene Cho. <laughs> good. good morning, everyone. All right, let's try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. What a joy and honor to be here, uh, and I really mean that sincerely. Um, as I situate myself here just a bit, I've got lots of notes that I'm hoping to get through. Um, it's been an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily busy season uh, in, in our lives, in part because uh, we do have three children ages 17, 15, and 12. Our, our oldest right now is filling out college applications, and I thought this was a parenting conference, and so I came. Uh, but uh, it's another conference. Um, so it's an amazingly uh, exciting and um, a season where we find ourselves constantly on our knees which is, I think, a good season. Uh, my wife and I, we've been married for 20 years, uh, or nearly 20 years. Uh, my wife is a marriage therapist. Pause for dramatic effect. Uh, that means that she wins the majority of our arguments at our home. And uh, this is not even a joke, but you know, therapists have like this counseling diagnosis book. It's like their version of, the, of their Bible, if you will. And anytime we get into a discussion or argument, she slowly goes and gets her book. And, and she gets her book, and then she'll start kind of looking through the pages as we're talking about a very passionate issue. And she'll look through and she'll go, hold on for a second. Um, you, uh, you are wrong. Um, and, and that ends our discussion. Um, our church uh, is also in an amazingly crazy season. Uh, if there's time and I'm discerning how to share this, uh, I will likely share it near the end of our sermon, but we're moving right now. Uh, we're moving our uh, facilities from one building to another. Um, and uh, so it's just an incredibly intense season, but... I am so delighted to be here. Uh, I flew in uh, late last night. Our flight was delayed. Got in around midnight. And priorities are straight, right? Because priorities are important. So I went straight to in and out to get a burger. <laughs> a couple of you understand. And I went there, and there were like lines. I mean, it was incredible. Like, what are these people doing at midnight? And I thought, well, they're probably just like me. And uh, but I'm here today uh, for numerous reasons, and uh, with that in mind, I'd like to maybe just begin with a word of prayer again, and as we continue to open up the scriptures. God, thank you again so much for who you are. We are here because of you. We do what we do because of you. God, we believe that our lives, our convictions, our pursuits, God, may it not be our own doing, our own response, but may it all be in response to the amazing, amazing gospel. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to read a scripture for us this morning, and then I want to spend some time navigating through uh, some stories and to navigating through the text uh, that I'd like to exegete with us today. It's from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Uh, listen for the Word of God. And now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. 
So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. And I'm going to jump a little bit to later in this particular chapter where it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. I was born uh, in Korea and immigrated to this country when I was six years old. I came to personal faith in Christ when I was 18 years old. My great-grandparents were among the first uh, believers in a small town outside of a larger city called Pyongyang. And if you know your world geography, Pyongyang happens to be the capital now of North Korea. So my parents were both born in what is now called North Korea. Uh, Back then, there was only one country, as you know, a war broke out that resulted in the fraction, not only of a nation into two countries, but severed and separated thousands upon thousands of families. We are one of those families. For the longest time, I did not know why my parents were sending money to North Korea. It was only later when they shared with me that they had cousins and relatives and family that were still living in North Korea. And they sent money not knowing if they were still alive or not, but what can you do when you receive random cryptic notes asking for funding? But I am stirred by the story of my great-grandparents who were among the first people to believe in Jesus. And I know this isn't necessarily a missions conference, but I want to take a moment to acknowledge and recognize and pay respect to these men and women. Decades ago, in response to the amazing gospel, they did crazy things. They got on boats, and before they got on boats, they made sure, for many of them, where caskets were built in their dimensions. Because they weren't quite sure what was going to happen, and if they were going to come back even alive. But they went, and they traveled across continents and oceans, so that they might live and preach the living word of God. And as a result, they saw women and men and children come to faith, and my great-grandparents were among them. And I'm grateful for them because they not only came to preach the gospel, but to live out the gospel on the streets. Because what good theology is, is not just good sermons from pulpits or from ivory towers of our theological institutions. It really engages the streets. It engages and it transforms real lives. And so as a result, as they were preaching the gospel, it's an amazing story of how these early missionaries, in partnership with women and men that were among the first believers, they were the ones who built the first orphanages in Korea. They built the first schools. They built the Harvards and the Princetons as we know it. They were the ones who built the first hospitals in Korea. They were the ones who were on the streets protesting against oppression and injustice. One of the reasons why I came to be a follower of Jesus, yes, is the scriptures, yes, it's the Holy Spirit, but it's the testimony of women and men that lived out the whole gospel. I am here this morning, again, just like one of you, in response to the gospel, but I'm also here to honor so many people that have invested in my life and so many people that have been sources of inspiration. 
And if I can, I'd like to just share a couple of these stories. I'm here because I deeply respect people like uh, Dr. Mimi Haddad. And I want to honor her and respect her. I think with all significant movements, there are people that champion these efforts. And they can be tiresome. They can even be dangerous. But we need these women and men. So I'm here in response to her warm invitation for me to come and partner with her in ministry. I am here today because of my wife. Despite the fact that she never lets me win any arguments in our home, she is truly someone that lives out Christ. She is a remedy to my cynicism because I see the face of Christ through her life, through her ministry, through her calling as a daughter, a mother, a wife, a follower of Christ, a herald of the gospel. I'm here because of my wife who have done some crazy things in response to the gospel, including planting Quest Church in Seattle, Washington. At times, she has shared that it is lonely being married to me because oftentimes we tend to elevate one person when we share our stories. And as the senior pastor of our church, uh, uh, people often see me as the founder of our church. And I have to be quick to remind them that uh, my wife, out of her faith, out of her courage, helped start this church. There's so many stories that I can share. I'm here today because of my mother. Uh, my mother who moved to Seattle three years ago with my father. They spent their entire life after immigration in San Francisco. But it was my mother who brought my father and their three sons, including their youngest, which is me, to faith. It was because of her testimony. It was because of my mother, like some or many stereotypical Korean mothers, she was the believing follower of Christ who wakes up every morning at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. This is a consistent story that you will hear among many faithful Korean mothers and grandmothers. She would wake up every morning at 4.30 in the morning and she would purposely open all the doors in her home so that the men could hear her playing and singing. <laughs> True story. Every morning she would quietly open these doors and she would pray and read the scriptures and I don't know what it is, but like all of them cannot clap in rhythm. But they would clap and they would sing. And she would sing and sing, and this went on for years. For years until, for whatever reason, that is truly a mystery and a work of the Holy Spirit, but in response to her faithfulness in the summer of 1989, my father and her three sons came to repentance and came to believe and came to follow Jesus Christ. I'm here because you hear these difficult but real stories. I actually believe Sometimes when you go to conferences and you hear speakers, uh, we tend to embellish stories like, no, I'm six foot four, I used to play in the NBA, and you would know that that's not true. But the truth is, sometimes we do embellish stories or make things somewhat more dramatic than maybe it is. 
And so when I actually share with you that I believe this conference and our conversations, it's a matter of life and death, I actually believe it's a matter of life and death. I really do. And that may not necessarily be the case in your context, in your life, but because we're called to be global citizens, our theology and what we believe, it impacts everyone around the world. I'm reminded of stories. The first time I recalled reading her story, she became instantaneously someone that I prayed for even though I knew I would never meet her. And certainly the world knows of the stories of young girls and women like Malala, but I was first introduced to the story by a younger woman named Shamsia. And Shamsia was a 17-year-old girl, an Afghani girl, who so wanted to go to school. But the men in her village would both bully her and her girlfriends and threatened her. Until one morning, these men on motorcycles circled around them and threw acid. all over their bodies and their faces. And if you dare have the courage to look and Google just the words, girls with acid on their face, you will see hundreds of young girls and women whose bodies and faces have been scarred. So no, I'm not being dramatic. This is about life, and it is about death. Which is the reason why I was so stunned when some local village reporters circled around the hospital bed and they asked Shamsia, um, will you stop going to school? Or what would you say to these men? She said, quote, I will go to my school even if they kill me. My message for my enemies is that if they did this 100 times, I am still going to continue my studies. That is courage. And so as we're speaking about courage today, about speaking up, not just for political correctness, but speaking up for biblical convictions, I hope that you would be reminded of the story of Shamsia and so many others who believe that they too are created in the image of God. I'm here today because I'm convicted about the stories of Kabugo Wasi, an 18-year-old mother of a baby girl named Esther in the DRC. About six years ago, my wife and I and our three children, we started a, a small little foundation called One Day's Wages a movement of people, stories, and actions to alleviate extreme global poverty. And more specifically, we wanted to do something in response to the gender inequality in our world. And I say this not to be boastful, so I pray that you would receive this with grace. But after praying in response to some convictions that we received, we felt the Holy Spirit challenge us to give up a year's wages. So it took us three years to save and simplify and sell off our belongings. And then we invited people around the world if they would consider giving just one day's wages at least once a year. So that we could pour these investments into partnership with women and men around the world in the local communities who are doing all that they can to uplift their communities with empowerment and education. And so in the last six years, it has been encouraging as we've raised over $3 million. 
as we've come alongside organizations and partners, but it's because of women like Kavugo Wasi, where in some parts, the DRC, and I want to be very careful in my storytelling, the DRC, like all countries, including our own, has beautiful expressions of culture and people. And like our country, it also has incredibly broken, fragmented images of our human depravity. And so while I can share stories of beauty, of these expressions, uh, we cannot also ignore the fact that in that particular country, in certain regions, it is estimated that 8 out of 10 women have been raped. Since 1996, because of cycles of conflict and violence, it has cost more than 5 million lives. And so right now, uh, just as one story, uh, One Day's Wages, we're working with a relief organization called World Relief, and we're trying to raise funds in part because it's not going to change the entire situation, but we're coming alongside 2,000 women who have been raped. And why is this important? Because as well talk about soon in the exegesis of John 4, it's amazing when something traumatic or difficult or painful or egregious or sinful has been happened to us, we make the victim oftentimes the source of their very own oppression. And so for someone like Kavugo Wasi, this 18-year-old mother of a baby girl named Esther, the result of the rape, she has been ostracized, marginalized, forever known in her village as the woman that has been raped. And it's easy to live into that narrative. It's easy even for her parents to live into a narrative which did not surprise me when we learned the story of how her parents then removed her from school because of the stigma and shame. And so the future has only one trajectory. Only one. I was reading a quote from Kavugo Wasi, this 18-year-old mother, this woman, this sister in Christ, who in response to a similar kind of partnership where there's counseling and training and support, she writes, quote, I no longer feel alone and I can smile again. I love my young daughter Esther, whom I used to hate because she brought back memories of the rape. And I enjoy meeting with the support group as I now know that as long as there is life, there is hope. I am studying again, and after school work, I sell charcoal. In the future, I'd love to have the means to expand my small business. So when I say that this is about life and death, it is not meant to be sensational or to be dramatic. Lastly, not for a sermon, but for that portion, <laughs> the reason why I'm here is because of the gospel. Amen. It is because of the gospel. When people ask me, Eugene, why are you so passionate about issues, about justice, or about equality? Why do these things matter to you? I tell them I care about justice, not simply because of justice itself, but because of the gospel. Amen. That when we believe in the whole gospel, it compels us to a life conviction that we care about all things, yes, including evangelism, 
but this incredible, deep, wide, vast vision of the kingdom of God. Amen. Which certainly includes, which certainly includes our sisters. I suspect time may be a challenge here, so let me try to move on. I want to share three things, knowing that part of my chat needs to be about misogyny in the church, or what does it mean to pursue equality in the church? And I don't have all the answers because I suspect that during our other talks and our classes today, we'll be able to maybe extrapolate that a little bit more. But I want to share with you three ways in which I see this as a father, as a person of cultural identity, and as a leader in the church. Now, I could share more, I just don't have time, so let me share these three things. As a father of three children, I realize that this is not just about my daughters, it's also about my son. It's about all of our children. Because you could say that everyone and every institution, every company is trying to feel messages to all of us, including our children. In a broad sense, you could say that what this world is about is how do we shake the lens by which we see everything. So when you look at advertisement or advertisers, and I have folks in our church who are working in marketing companies, I'll tell you that one of the first things that you learn in marketing classes and universities is something equivalent to the Bible of marketing classes where they tell you psychologically there's about five things that every human being has insecurities about, and so they try to pick and prod on these five things about beauty, about power, about success, and on and on. And so we need to know in the same ways that we've been influenced that our young people are being influenced. Now you never know that because as you're growing old, sometimes our vision is so myopic. But as we have three children, two older daughters and a son, I've been much more sensitive to what they read and see. Like, I never grew up, for example, as a young man, some of the messages that my daughter hears. And it's actually kind of disturbing that, yes, in a city of Seattle known for its progressiveness, there is not a week that has gone by since they've gone to school where our daughters have said, guess what happened this week? Someone, some kid, some parent, some teacher said to the equivalent, you're a girl, you can't. Now, I'm not naive. I, I know these things happen. I just didn't realize it happened so pervasively. In fact, I remember a story that took place when my second daughter... I mean, she's amazing. If I can boast for a second, she's a starting point guard for a high school basketball team. Incredible, wicked crossover dribble that she learned from her father. <laughs> but when she was turning nine years old, she said, Dad, Mom, uh, I want to have a slumber party. She said this looking to her mom, her mom, Minji, was being very kind and pastoral, contemplating it. I'm like on the other side of the room. <laughs> but she asked and asked, and so we said, all right, let's do this. Our first slumber party. And so nine girls gathered in the basement of our home for an overnight slumber party to celebrate our daughter's birthday. Now, Minji is a morning person, I'm a 
kind of a late night owl, so she said, this is your responsibility to watch them until they go to sleep. My daughter says to me, Dad, don't come downstairs. <laughs> but I had to check in on them, so around 11 or 12 o'clock, under the guise of wanting to make sure they had enough refreshments, I slowly made my way downstairs, quietly. And I went down quietly in part because I wanted to kind of just hear their conversations, to be honest. <laughs> so as I was walking downstairs, I had to pause because I wasn't quite sure what I was hearing. And I actually sat down in the stairs because what I was hearing was so disturbing. And I didn't quite know what to do or say. These nine girls between the ages of nine and ten had gotten together in a circle. And they were going around telling each girl how much weight they needed to lose. So yes, this profoundly matters. for our girls, for our boys, for our young women, for our young men. It matters for all of us. You see, when the average American watches an average of 31 hours of TV in a week, listens to 17 hours of music, three hours dedicated to movies, and who knows how much time we engage with the internet, they say that the average person consumes anywhere from seven to ten hours of media in one form or another. And so when, yes, girls are taught at a very young age that their worth is dependent on what they look like, that is injustice. When according to some sources, 78% of girls hate their bodies by the age of 15, 65% having developed an eating disorder, 17% cutting themselves. I'm not being dramatic. This is why the whole gospel is so important. I cannot help but also look at this conversation from my cultural lens. In the same manner that Pastor Ken shared a bit from his lens, and as we all do, there are certain lens by which I see and engage, and I need Christ and the gospel message to redeem and to even rebuke certain messages that are not consistent with scriptures and with his heart. Now, it would be probably dramatic and erroneous for me to say that all Asian culture is prone to be against women. And that's not what I hope you walk away with. As a second generation Korean American man who pastored in Korea for a couple of years who's married to a woman who's native Korean, I want you to know that I am very, very proud to be Korean American. But I've learned as a follower of Christ to have the courage to be able to look into our culture to assess things that are contrary to the scriptures and to God's vision of the flourishing of humanity. 
And so you begin to speak out against such things. And so it was later in my life when I realized that so much of my lens as a Korean man was influenced by my Confucian-laden culture. And this Confucian culture, which I think I would argue is a borderline philosophy slash religion because it was so deep in so much Asian countries, what we learned in that worldview for women is that women were born to serve their fathers as young girls. They were then to serve their husbands when they got married. And then they were to serve their grown sons when they were older mothers. Which then explained to me when I called my grandfather, who I love, He passed away a few years ago, but when I called my grandfather from Seattle, and he was living in Seoul, Korea, and I said, Haramuji! Haramuji! Which means grandfather in Korean, but you probably knew that. Grand Haramuji! Minyago Jago Eginasayo. We have a baby! We have a beautiful, beautiful daughter. And my grandfather started sobbing. And at first I thought, wow, he really loves me. (laughs) And I know he does. Except he went on to say how disappointed he was. And it's for that reason that in many, again, dominant cultures where Confucianism is prevalent, women were ordered to walk at least three steps behind their husbands. Women were encouraged to keep their last names in the Korean culture, not because of equality, but because they were not deemed worthy to carry the names of their husbands. So I see this, yes, from the lens as a father, from the lens of a person deeply influenced by my culture growing up, But thankfully, I'm also deeply influenced by the scriptures and by the Holy Spirit. Because as we engage this conversation, as I shared earlier, especially as we speak about misogyny in the church and about trying to pursue equality in the church, the whole church, I think about how important it is that we approach this wisely and prayerfully so that people might not ever accuse us that we're simply speaking of this out of political correctness or cultural relevance. Now, I'm not suggesting that those conversations can't be had, but for us as followers of Christ, our deepest, most significant understanding of how we approach this ought to be the same for all things. Which is why, when we see the scriptures, while this isn't a talk to go into all of them, because I do know it's been spoken about from others, I'm reminded of the narrative of God's creation of mutuality in Genesis. It is compelling. I'm reminded of a guy named Jesus Christ who ought to have some clout and authority in our lives and in the church, who through his very words and living and words demonstrated a vision of the kingdom of God. And I'm reminded of the distribution of the spiritual gifts in the Pentecost that was shared to the wide church. And I'm reminded of the wisdom that we need as we study the context of Paul's instructions to the early church. 
In the same way that people say context matters to many things, I sometimes wonder why context shouldn't be applied to Paul's instructions about women to the early church. Upon giving a sermon some time ago at my church, and I have the amazing privilege of serving with um, many gifted women and men, including four female pastors at our church. Pastor Katie, who oversees our children and families ministries, is probably one of the most gifted people that I know. I'm inspired by Pastor Liz Mosbo for Hage, our pastor of local and global ministries, and she is probably the brightest person that I know. Has her PhD from a fancy fancy school in Chicago called Northwestern, a PhD in ethics, and she constantly tells me, well, she shows me how much we need her voice and the voices of others. I get to serve with Pastor Gail Song Bantam, one of the most courageous people that I know. I get to serve with Pastor Brenda Salter McNeil, excuse me, Dr. Pastor Reverend Brenda Salter McNeil, <laughs> who is a social preacher and communicator. <laughs> Many are laughing because for those that don't know her, she's probably one of the most gifted communicators in our generation. But upon giving a talk some time ago, I had a young woman at our church write me these words. Pastor Eugene, at one point today, you said, women, you were created equal to men in the image of God. I'm mainly right because I don't know if you realize how powerful that statement was. I don't know if you realize what it would feel like to hear that statement coming from a man, what it would mean to me and possibly to other individual women and men. You didn't even say it to me individually. I have never been told by a man, Christian or not, that I am equal to him. I have never been told by a man that I am equal to him and equal in that we are both created in the image of God. I cried all the way home. How is it that as a 36-year-old woman, I've never been told by a male person that I am equal to him, that I am equally beautiful and broken, that we are both created in the image of God? Women are deeply wounded by living in this world and wounded that men don't fight for us. Instead, they fight to rule us. And we, sometimes we fight, but most of the time we believe them when they tell us we aren't worth our weight. Sometimes taken literally. Today, I felt like a man was fighting for me, not because I can't fight for myself, but because he recognized the wrongs in a world and a church that have benefited him unfairly. So I pastor a church in Seattle, a city that is known for its progressiveness. And I can't tell you the number of people that have never seen a woman speak from the stage. I don't even say preach. I just said a woman on stage. Now I know I'm running out of time. I'm inspired by the story in John 4 because I know it's a story that you're all familiar with. But I was particularly captivated some years ago when I was reading through it carefully again, and I saw the words from John chapter 4 where it said, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, you know that Jesus didn't have to do anything. I mean, he's Jesus. 
he can do whatever he wants, but it actually puts more emphasis on the scripture because it reminds us that everything that he does, every step, every word, every interaction has a purpose that is meant to give us illumination of God's heart and God's kingdom. So when John chapter 4 says Jesus had to go through Samaria, we begin to realize the cultural, sociological reasons why it was so significant. Going back to 2 Kings chapter 17, when he began to realize deep animosity and friction between Jews and Samaritans, people that were considered full-blooded, people that were considered not full-blooded, and as a result, not equal in the sight of God, dirty, marginalized, oppressed, cursed by God. And in this also happened to be how women were viewed. So in the biblical times, when people in the southern region, which is where Jesus is, had to go up to the northern region, the problem was there was a big chunk of land occupied by a group of people called Samaritans. Because it was Samaria. But what people did is that you did not cross this land. For many reasons. And as a result, people would actually travel all the way east cross the Damascus River, head up all the way around in order to circumvent Samaria altogether. That path, that trip, took nearly three to four times the length, but that's what people did at all costs in order to avoid Samaria and Samaritans. Which is the reason why it's so powerful that Jesus comes and he knows that he will engage the Samaritan woman at the well. Now, there's three things as a refresher for all of you, probably, why this is such a powerful story. One, she was a Samaritan. Two, she was living and basically seen in the singular narrative as a woman living a sinful lifestyle. Now, we all know the gospel is good news to all who need a Savior, and that's all of us. But can you imagine... Being known for your life by your worst mistakes. Can you imagine the oppression, the burden, the antithetical essence of the gospel to be known by your worst mistakes? See, this woman, I'm convinced that wherever she went, that's the woman. And maybe it had gotten so public that people stop wasting the time of even whispering. That's the woman who has multiple... That's the woman who's been sleeping around. That's the woman who was sinful and depraved. That's the woman cursed by God. That's probably all that she heard. Which explains why she was fetching water alone. Because water, as you know, was an incredibly communal event for both community and for protection. And the third reason why this is so scandalous is because she's a woman. That in itself was scandalous. This explains why the religious leaders, predominantly the Pharisees, who were considered religious leaders of the street, they were local pastors, if you will, the Sadducees occupied more the political realm. The Pharisees, it was for this reason, when the Pharisees prayed publicly, which they did three times a day, because that's what good Pharisees, religious leaders did, they prayed out in public. They often began their prayers with what theologians call the prayers of gratitude. They would extend their hands out, Probably made sure that they were being seen, good angles for photos. And then they would say, God, I thank you that I am a Jew and not a Gentile. God, I thank you that I am a free person and not a slave. And the last one was always the kicker. God, oh God. Emphasis is mine. Oh God, thank you that I am a man and not a woman. 
which is the reason why when you actually do read Paul's letters to the church in Galatia, Galatians 3.28, in my opinion, happens to be the most scandalous scripture in the New Testament. There is neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, but we are one in Christ Jesus. Because what it does, literally, in my opinion, in Paul's wisdom, trying to engage a very, very combative culture, deeply laden by views that were contrary to God's vision for human flourishing, is that in his subtle ways, he's trying to give us a vision, an image, yes, of the restoration of what God is and will continue to do to bring all things back unto himself. So what does this mean with the church? Well, what I would say in closing is this, for you and for me, when we look at Samaria, my concern and my challenge and my exhortation, and I'm preaching to myself, is everyone loves the idea of Samaria. Everyone loves the idea of justice. Everyone loves the idea of compassion. Like at a Christian conference, if I said, who here doesn't like the idea of reconciliation? Like you raise your hands and all of us will judge you. So as we're speaking about Jesus, who did not just talk about Samaria, but he actually walked through Samaria in order to demonstrate, I'm reminded of these words from St. Francis of Assisi who said, it is no use walking anywhere to preach if your walking is not your preaching. That means the very way that we live our lives and the very way that we serve in our church, speak in our church, lead in our church, that's what matters. Why? Because you can talk about Samaria, you can sing about Samaria, you can write books about Samaria, you can write liturgies about Samaria, you can be spitting rhymes and poetry about Samaria, you can be doing lots of things about Samaria, it's still different than walking through Samaria. And so we need people that love Christ, love the scriptures, and love the local church. To think about how it is that we seek to live out and demonstrate these things. One of the things that you can be praying for, and I'll close with this. I'm sorry if I went long. One of the things that you can be praying for, our church is going through a really interesting, extraordinary season. We're moving churches in four weeks. In my wildest imagination and dreams, and I'm sure this is the case for you, you never ever, when you move into another church, you want that to happen because that church has outgrown their space, and so they have to move to another space. That, being people that are kingdom-minded, that's what we want, don't we? And so uh, we've been looking for a church for the last three years because our church has been growing and facing some growing pains and challenges. And we somehow, through some incredibly painful, difficult things that no one could have imagined, we are moving into a church that was once the flagship building of a church called Mars Hill Church. That was... um, the senior pastor was Mark Driscoll. Now, I want to be really careful here. Because I think it is really painful sometimes, and I think shameful when we as Christians were um, not exercising care and wisdom when we're talking about difficult seasons in other people's lives. Uh, pastor Mark and I have had our share of discussions and arguments about women in ministry. And so it pains me to see him, his family, and his church going through these things. But it's also been really amazing to hear from people that have been praying about how this could be a redemptive story. And that's what we're praying for. A redemptive story for our neighbors who 
are so upset that another church is coming into the area, who are furious that another church is coming into the area, but also, I think, redemptive for people who have been silenced. Oh, I, I, I just can't wait till Pastor Brenda gets up on that stage and... Um, <laughs> And again, it's not because we see this as something to be hurtful about, but in some ways that it would testify to Galatians 3.28, that it testifies to what Jesus shows here because this woman, I love this verse, the Bible says, because of her testimony, the whole village came to believe in Jesus. She is one of my heroes because she's probably one of the most underwritten about, underrated church planter and evangelist in the story of the scriptures. And so may God bless you. May God give you courage together. Together for the whole gospel. And all God's people sin. Amen. Amen.